Welcome to Viking Aircraft Engines. We're going to do a video tonight and it's going to be in regards to how to install the Honda Accord engine, the Viking 195 engine in the Zenith Super Duty. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down into sections and discover one area at a time. We'll start with how do we physically mount the engine to the airframe. Now, since this Super Duty has flown for almost three years, the uh, let's just point out what's different as far as the engine mount between now and then. Um, the first Super Duty mounts that went out, which are perfectly fine, have this mount that you're seeing here, meaning that there is a square cage in the middle all the way around that holds the engine and the top tubes. Later mounts in order to just give a little bit more room for the intercooler as you can see in this intercooler we, we wanted to add a new intercooler uh, with more capacity we have to kind of come around here so these tubes have been eliminated and there is a diagonal tube now from the bottom here that goes up to this corner here. So, and that's very traditional. Uh, the square caged thing is uh, a little bit more labor, just as strong, but in order to open up that area uh, and get rid of this tube to have some room behind the engine, the later mounts don't have that tube. So you could have one or the other mount. As far as the mounts themselves, uh, newer mounts, later mounts, uh, you obviously want to put a level on the engine and then a reference line on the airplane and then just level the engine. This engine mount needed uh, some spacing right here as you can see. Now let's take a look at the actual mounting of the bolts as they go into the airplane. The corner bolts are exactly like the videos that you've seen of the Zenith 750. This is still a Zenith 750. So you want to watch all the videos pertaining to the 750 installation. So it's very similar. Bolts go through and they go on the back and there's a lock nut on the back side. Sometimes on the bottom, we use a different kind of lock nut, an MS nut, because there's less room against the floorboards. You want to do the top last and then center it especially if you have wings already on the airplane you want to be very careful at this point because this will uh, straighten or make your airplane crooked depending on the v shape in the window right here and where that is located side to side versus where the engine mount is located so you want to get that all straight and then just drill make sure that there's steel on the back side and on the front side so that when you drill through you can get the bolts and the lock nuts on the back side. That's all there is to actually physically mounting the engine mount to the airframe. You don't want to mount the mount to the airframe rigidly. You can maybe do, you know, the sides and leave this one alone until the end. But at that point, you want to get the engine hanging. And once you get the engine hanging, then uh, you can do the top. Too many things at one time, and it'll be harder and harder to make things align for yourself. Now let's talk about the actual rubber cushions and how that's done. So the physical installation of the rubber mounts are the same in all four corners. You're gonna use a lock nut on the back side. Then there's a large area washers, the rubber cones go into the mount, and another, uh, large area washer if there's room, uh, AN6 washer, and tighten it down until you can feel it bottom out because there's a steel insert that you're putting inside the rubber pieces during assembly. Do that on all four corners. Uh, loosely do this first and check the, the level of the cage uh, per plans and the uh, being perpendicular to the gearbox or something that's straight on a level on top of the engine and then tighten everything down. Now when we have the engine hanging, we might as well attack one of the other larger parts of the installation, which will be the radiator. Now don't get confused 
about our baggage compartment here on our Super Duty. As you can see from this point down of the firewall, this is something that we added. And we have that available for any Super Duty builder. And it gives you a nice sleek line to the airplane. It also gives you a lot of baggage area below the airplane. But that's an add-on. As you can see, the radiator sits in here, and we're gonna talk about how to install the radiator. Grab the radiator, install the rubber mounts. There's gonna be two rubber mounts here, two rubber mounts on the other side. And then we also use two rubber mounts on the bottom. We riveted uh, an angle to the radiator, as you can see here. Of course, this airplane has 300 hours, so there's a little dirt and stuff that's been kicked up, and flies and everything, but this is what it looks like. At an angle right there, and there's a rubber damper and then another rubber damper. If you don't have the baggage pot, of course, this bottom brace has to go uphill up to the bottom of the fuselage. Now, as far as aligning the radiator on the airplane, uh, if you look here at these rubber mounts, you can kind of look here on top and you see three rivets there that are factory from the fuselage. And you see one of the screws are like uh, 3 8 of an inch outboard of the central rivet. And it's far, far enough away from the firewall that you can get a nut and a lock washer. So that's the location of the radiator, left and right and front to back. Once that's all bolted in, the reason by the way, we don't use lock nuts here, we use lock washers is because if the rubber dampers ever get old, which of course they will eventually, uh, it's easy to crack a nut loose and then spin the nut off. It's much harder to get a lock washer, lock nut off if the rubber uh, unit is failing up there. So that's the main reason for that. So uh, mount that also, of course, you wanna take a look at where your nose wheel is so you can clear the radiator behind the nose wheel. But the location I just gave you should be just perfect for the installation. Now let's take a look at the routing of the coolant lines that, or hoses that are gonna go back to the engine. So prior to actually talking about the routing of the hoses, of course you can route them any which way you want, but might as well just follow what we did here, we know it works. Let's uh, understand the way the coolant flows through the engine. Let's start with the pump. Here's the coolant pump. We don't say water pump because we use coolant we use the npg waterless coolant for low pressure and uh, that's why we don't really have any water in it but here's the pump it's driven by the serpentine belt and <clears throat> the pump pumps coolant into the engine okay so now it's being fed through this tube that's running here the tube goes to the thermostat housing that means that the thermostat is controlling the amount of coolant that enters the pump, not the other way around, like maybe on some of the older V8s, where the thermostat controlled what came out of the engine and went to the radiator. So wherever the thermostat is, is in to the engine. That's coolant going into the engine. Now, if you want coolant to go into the engine, from the radiator, you want to pick up that coolant from the lowest spot so you don't pick up any air bubbles. Hence, right down here. This is the lowest point on the radiator and that is going to the engine. So coolant will then flow down through the radiator, actually across in this case, but still across and down. And then it goes through this 45 and through a pre-cut tube with beads at each end 90 degree forward, another 90. That's an actually kind of a long 90 in order to clear the exhaust pipe and then into the exhaust manifold. Um, watch that not every connection is exactly the same. Like for instance here, we have a screw, uh, Ediker screw clamp. That's also in order to be able to remove an entire section of hose. And then in between, we either use those or we use these crimp type overlapping oetical clamps. So that is going from the radiator into the engine through the thermostat 
then down through that pipe we saw and into the coolant pump, pumps it through the engine and then it exits through the hottest part of the engine, which is the cylinder head, which happens to be in a very similar location, but just inboard of it. And then that hose runs back to the radiator. We run it down here, we run it across, and then we run it into the radiator. And as you're lining this up, you can cut your silicone elbows, get everything situated, use some O-ring grease on everything, make sure it clears everywhere, get it nice and even. You can even use one tube to tie another to it if you want. And then you finish it off by putting the clamps on and squeezing it all down. Now, this is uh, kind of an old setup. This is what we started with. You probably don't have this. There's nothing wrong with that, but your thermostat um, cap, your five pound cap, five pounds because it's the NPG coolant, which runs low pressure, is likely up on here now, tapped and threaded down into here, which is a little different from what you see here. Some other cooling lines that are associated with this engine are, uh, there's one here that cools the turbocharger, very important. You want the turbocharger to be cooled. And then there's a return from the turbocharger, right here, right back into the pipe that goes to the pump and then back around again. So that's the circuit to cool the turbocharger. There's also oil that cools the turbocharger. We just have it in focus now. The turbocharger has a oil line, a return line by gravity feed right here, right back into the engine crankcase. There's also a pressurized line from the turbocharger that goes in the back here. And we can pick that up a little bit later because it's too many. Yeah, actually we can see it right here. Right inside here is the pressurized line from the engine block. There's a screen in there. It filters the oil and it is that's pressurized and it goes up on top of the turbocharger and it, and it then goes through the turbocharger and then down gravity feed back into the sump like that. So that's the turbocharger, a little bit of a side jump there, but that's how the, since we're talking about cooling, that's how everything is cooled. There's also a hose from here, as you can see this one's capped off, but on later engines, which is what we would have, this then runs to the coolant bottle over here this one, of course, runs to that obsolete uh, piece right here that I told you about. So it runs to the coolant bottle. You wanna make sure that's always full to the first line. During the first run-ups and stuff, you wanna have more coolant in there because every time the engine cools down, it will suck the coolant back in. That's also why you want this bottle lower on the firewall than this, which yours, of course, like I said, will be up here. And the reason for that is so that you can open the cap without this coolant that's in the bottle just running down and overflowing. So you want the suction bottle lower than the cap. And that's all there is to the routing of the coolant. Of course, you wanna do it properly and you want it all to be secure. Uh, these, I think, are the absolute best clamps. They're more pricey. We do have them. We, we use them usually here and there. And then we use the crimp clamps in other places. Um, but as far as which one is better, um, I kind of like these. These are, these are more money, but they're really nice. All right, that covers the cooling system. Very simple and straightforward for the engine. There's no particular sequence we have to talk about these things as far as the installation. So if we jump around a little bit, that's okay. Let's talk about the exhaust. Of course, the engine comes with everything mounted, a turbocharger and everything, but it's it's not likely that we put the exhaust pipe on the engine when it got shipped because it's quite long and it sticks down. Now, the exhaust is uh, a two-piece system. If you have a different kind of exhaust, you might wanna to talk to a Viking if you have an earlier style. This is the production version now and it works really good. Uh, it is lightweight, it is extremely quiet, 
and it's not very likely to have any issues with cracking or anything like that because of its construction. So what you are gonna have is an elbow that bolts to the turbocharger, and these are bolts, any kind of exhaust bolts, you know, it's always important that you put uh, anti-seize on them because over time it gets harder and harder to remove something like that. So you wanna put anti-seize and just, you don't even have to tighten them that hard, just check them once in a while because you wanna be able to maintain or service or replace a gasket in the future. Now, as you can see here, there's a V-band clamp right here. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is put the gasket on and you're going to put anti-season, you can put the flange on there. That's the 90 degree elbow. That's the heavy duty part. Um, from there on, there's a transition from your three inch to your two inch pipe. That's an important part because it quiets the exhaust down tremendously. A continued out three inch pipe, which we did try, didn't was not successful because it's extremely loud. Now the engine with this setup is exceptionally quiet and we get comments on how quiet it is. And that was the, the only thing that needed to be done was to put a reducer and bring it down to two inches here from here out. This is rosette welded in three places in order for that to not have a continuous weld and it will not fail right here. Obviously there's movement in a tailpipe. That's what we gotta be worried about. We have pulses from the propeller, we have air pressure. So there's always some movement in a tailpipe in an airplane, particularly a propeller airplane. So it's important that we design something that will not crack. This V-belt, uh, V-band clamp uh, is set up in a sense, as you can see, there are two nuts on there. And the reason for that is you wanna tighten that up just enough that in fact, the whole system can move a little bit. I don't know if you can hear this, Of course, I'm shaking the camera too, but there's just enough play there. We leave this just loose that there's a little bit of movement, okay? And then you lock nut it. And you want that so that the tailpipe can be free of the engine vibration. And once you have that done and you check it on our routinely, on your 100 hour inspections and stuff, then that is a very reliable exhaust system. Another mention of that, of course, is that a lot of times you might want to like trial fit it and then take it back off if you're curious how it fits because once you start working on the cowling, you do want to know where to cut the hole. If you do mount it, you can measure things like from the exhaust pipe to the firewall, from the exhaust pipe to some spots on the engine. And that way when the cowling is on, you can kind of lay out where the exit hole is eventually going to be with the exhaust off the engine. Let's just jump to something like the propeller since it's right in front of us here. This will be one of the last things you install, but this is uh, happens to be a uh, three inch extension. You're gonna need something about a three inch extension because of the cowling length and the fit up of the five bladed propeller. Even if you use our three bladed uh, propeller about three inches is what you want for extensions. Now, we do run a uh, inch and a half extensions on a lot of our airplanes. Uh, for a three inch extension, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your inch and a half and it goes on the engine and it's a stackable extension. So you're gonna use two of these and they index with each other and then one goes on top of the other and of course I'm not gonna do it now, but you would then just basically wiggle it until those two went together. And that gives you your three inch extension once that's together. And then your propeller will then, this will, the indents here will go on the engine. Your propeller would go here and the bolts would clamp everything down together. The Duke and the um, NR prop that we use for this large machine both use uh, around 200 inch pounds of uh, torque on the eight millimeter bolts that run through all this. Fuel system, let's talk about that. First off, this is the fuel filter that's now standard for everything on the Viking engine. Even if you have an earlier engine, you might wanna to upgrade to these filters. Put a little bit of O-ring grease there. 
these are what goes in your hoses and everything is now a snap together quick disconnect type of fit you can pull those in on and off as you as you may these are our low pressure filters and our high pressure filters all three filters are the same and there's a clear marking on the side which way the flow goes so i'm pointing that out before i start showing you the earlier design that we have in this airplane which of course was built three years ago uh, clearly right away you see a filter right here that is an earlier design nothing wrong with that filter but not quite as convenient as with the quick disconnect where you can replace it in, you know in a heartbeat just by pulling the quick disconnect off on each side change the filter put a little o-ring grease on the fittings and slide the quick disconnect with its internal Python o-ring right back on now let's take a look at the entire system of course you are building a super duty but I would recommend that you seriously look into watching all the videos for the 701, 750 installations. Uh, the cruiser, the 750 stall, whatever. Uh, the fuel lines eventually are going to come out, four of them up in top of the airplane here, two from each side. Other videos show the actual routing, putting grommets through the airplane and how to get those fuel lines here. As you can see, the low pressure filters here are different than what I just showed you. So yours will be the new style and we will upgrade these to the, be the new style as well. Um, so that means there's three filters total. There's the two pre-filters and there's a high pressure filter and they're all the same now. The only thing you gotta watch is which direction the fuel is flowing through the filter. These wires that are up here are different, different things. Some of them are go out to the wings. Some of them are for the fuel uh, transducer that's in this tank and some are for the pumps themselves and these are fuel pumps that are inside the tank the tanks are is mounted with the pumps down the positive lead is the one closest to the edge of the pump on both pumps and uh, there's a drain we use it as a drain we, we have there's two openings in the bottom of this tank one we use as a drain that's what you should do put a a steel or copper pipe down through the floor put a union there and you can either do a quick drain like this for a quick something of the system or there's a variety of different kinds of drains available um, you can put one there that you can you know turn and you can open it some of them have a hose connection there's all kinds it is a very convenient place you might keep that in mind to empty the entire airplane if you want to for whatever maintenance reasons. So of course, holding that up with your fingers would take forever and you wouldn't have any fingers at the end. Uh, but the way I thought of it when I put it in is if I ever did have to drain the whole airplane, I would just take a couple of wrenches and hold this one and just unscrew that one and put it back in later. But like I said, different options there for the drain. The header tank itself is mounted like we have described in other videos with a three quarter by three quarter square piece of tubing that's milled. We actually make these now with a milled slot on the back so you can feed the clamps through. Be careful that you put the clamps through ahead of time. These are not the kind of clamps that you can feed through after the fact that there's too much stuff at each end of the clamp. So you have to put the clamps against the skin and put the square rod on top of that with its milled out sections and rivet it all in place. And the clamps would just kind of be dangling there until you're ready to mount the tank. Then you mount the tank, you tighten all this stuff uh, to, if you don't have spring loaded ones, these are not, they're just direct and they're uh, 35 to 40 inch pounds. And actually if there's springs too, there's about the same as far as the tightness of those. You do want to, in addition to clamping the tank, you never want to bolt a tank to anything. It should always be kind of clamped. At least provide some kind of a rotational arrest to the tank. And we do that usually through a little bar uh, out of aluminum. This one is just riveted to the uh, back seat. And this is, by the way, the back seat in the Super Duty. A little unusual to see a seat cushion there for those that are building a 750 non super duty but that's what it is um the thing you know just bend up a piece of scrap aluminum and then 
screw it to the many holes that are threaded in the tank. As you can see, and I point this out every time, even with the shortest of AN bolts, we have some washers there and we have carefully just checked what the depth of the holes are in the tank because we definitely don't want to bottom out and break a hole into our nice new header tank. So that's the physical mounting of the tank. Now let's take a look at the routing of the fuel lines that go to the tank. All right, now, as far as getting to doing this work, you can do this at the end. You don't have to have your plane like partially built or anything like that. But what I would do is, you know, don't put the rudder cables in because that's what cuts the, the hole here in half. So if you don't have rudder cables, then then everything else is, is easy to get to here. It's not hard at all. Um, we talked about the fuel lines going in, so that's that's done. You know, there's four uh, threaded fittings on top. Like I said, there's lots of videos already uh, about this. You know, let me kind of like still bring my camera up there so you can see it. But I, I would recommend you, you view other videos as well. But basically, Here's what you got. You got your fuel transducer and you got your four hoses coming in from up above. Two are vents, two are feeds, two, one from each tank. Now, at the bottom, and, and also uh, on this one, can't really see it, I guess, but we there's another hose. I'm going to tell you in a little bit about that. And it's like something that we've added later. And it has been added to this installation as well. But let's talk about that particular hose last. The basic ones are coming out of each fuel pump. Okay, so we got fuel pump one, fuel pump two. Doesn't really matter which one's what. We've got electrical connections to them that go to the panel, positive and negative. Don't tee the negatives together. Run all separate wires all the way up front to your buses so everything is clear. Nothing is connected together and it's all redundant to each other. Now the fuel hoses that come out of the tanks go to this splitter block, okay? This comes with your firewall forward kit and it is a block of aluminum that's machined. All the ports in this block meet, okay? So there's no, there's no secrets going on inside. They're all just connected to each other. One of them, uh, right here, it's just simply a fuel transducer for your instrumentation that shows how much pressure is in the system. The hoses that come from the tank we just looked at from the fuel pumps, one goes there, one goes there. Those have arrows on them that point towards the block, the machine block. Those are check valves. That means that fuel coming in from one cannot go back out the other or the other way around. So it's a backflow prevention so that when you run one fuel pump, it's pumping to the engine and not just to the block and then back to the tank. There are check valves also in the pumps that are in the tanks. These are redundant to that, just to have a uh, backup for that. So those are the only two going to the block. Uh, now coming off of the block, there is one on the back side here that goes down to the filter, okay? So it goes right here and it comes into the high pressure filter and then it goes all the way forward to the engine. And from here to the engine, there's no brakes. Everything from here is all one hose and it goes to the engine so you can't have any leaks as long as you keep it from chafing. If you wanna have anything else like a fuel flow transducer or anything else in the system, it should be back here, it should be out of the uh, compartment and away from anything. It should be an uninterrupted line from here to the engine. Now, there's only one more line and it's something we added later and that was because of something that's called uh, direct injection. It's a direct injected engine and there could be high pressure fuel from the mechanical fuel pump on the engine. If it ever bled back into this low pressure system, even though this is 43 PSI, it would still be considered a low pressure system in comparison to 2,200 pounds, which is what the, all the stainless steel lines on the engine and the mechanical pump pumps right into the cylinders of the engine for the direct injection. If that system leaked back into this rubber system, we want that high pressure fuel to bleed off. We don't want it to like stay in the rubber lines and pressurize the lines with that kind of pressure. 
So there is a, another hose that was added and it goes to the machine block and you can barely see it there. You see the, the line there that goes to the filter. Let me talk about him. And right next to it, there's another line kind of hiding. And that's a 10,000 orifice that just bleeds a tiny, tiny amount of fuel back when you shut the system down to the header tank to prevent any kind of overpressurization when the airplane's parked on the ramp. Now, this one goes to the top of the header tank, but that was just because we elected to do that. We've now decided that there's no reason to go up there and put a T in one of the hoses or anything. You can just bring this right from there and there's an extra port available to you right here on the bottom of the header tank. So you use that one. One is for the drain and one is for the high pressure return, the bleed in case type of thing like I just told you. And that's also explained on the fuel diagrams and in other videos and so forth. So that's the entire fuel system for the Viking engine. Uh, there's no return lines, there's no nothing. Everything happens inside this tank. These fuel pumps have the regulators built into them. They have pre-filters built into them. Not big enough that we rely on them. Again, we have pre-filters in addition to the filters in the pumps. And uh, But it's a very nice setup. It's uh, The pumps are in there, the, re the returns are in there. The regulators are in there and it's all backed up by another pump. So all the redundancy you could want is right there. That's your fuel system as far as back here. All right, I think we're gonna call it quits there for tonight. Uh, I don't wanna do too much in one video. I'm thinking about breaking it up into several video videos. I don't think we should short you either as far as like just kind of plowing through it and good enough type of thing. We should share all of the knowledge that we have and we will. So we call this video or super duty installation video number one, and then we're going to get number two and so forth and so on. There might not be a perfect sequence as far as which way you would install things, but it will all be here. I would suggest you bring like a laptop or something to your hangar or wherever you're working on your plane. And we're going to cover all the details. We'll cover the fuel system up front. We'll cover the wiring. We'll cover what kind of instrumentation we recommend for this engine. Obviously, this is a high-performance engine, turbocharged and so forth. So you want to have uh, the knowledge to operate this engine and the instrumentation to tell you what you need to know to safely operate the engine. So we're going to cover everything uh, from our fuel system to our electrical system, which is underneath the seats. Uh, our unpanel, the instrumentation that we have, the options that you could add if you wanted even more instrumentation, and uh, also go into the details of how the engine operates, how it functions, what the different things on the engine are, and so forth and so on. So a lot to come. Uh, see you in Super Duty number two.